inside of me and I feel like I have to defend myself. Somebody's talking about me. I gotta defend myself. I gotta fight back. Can't just let them do, just walk all over me. I gotta fight back. And one of the beautiful things about God is He is our avenger. He says that He will avenge us. Some of y'all may have heard of the Avengers in the Marvel Universe and there's many characters. You know, it started out as a comic and then they made movies, but uh, some of them are like the Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, you know, some of the, the top three there. And there's no Avenger like our God. Amen. There's no way we could ever fight the battle or war better than him. And we're gonna come into situations where people are going to come against you, are going to attack you belittle you, try to bring you down to their level. And tonight we're going to be talking about some of those folks. Tonight we're going to be talking about there will always be naysayers. Let's look at the definition of naysayer because that's not really a, a phrase or a word that we've heard uh, uh, often, but it is still around. But anyway, it's naysayer, one who denies, refuses, or opposes or is skeptical or cynical about something. And then it gives a quick little definition here, I mean a quick little uh, use of the word. It says, there are always naysayers who say it can't be done. So how much does that ring true? There's always somebody out there, rah, rah, that ain't gonna ever work for you. You can't do it. There's always somebody in the background saying, rah, 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 you can't do it. Or they try to discourage you. They try to stop you from bettering yourself. That can't be done. You can't do it. And if you listen to them, they win. There will always be naysayers, and usually before, during, or after God uses you in a big way. Don't listen to the naysayers. They are sent by the devil to distract you away from what God's purpose is for you. They are there to pull you away or distract you or get you to give up before you've even fulfilled your purpose. The devil knows what he's doing. He's been doing it for a long time. But ironically, or more so God-ordained, today we ourselves ran into some of our biggest naysayers as a confirmation to the message today. We overcame our naysayers, and you can too. So, oddly enough, we ran into some people who were, you know, speaking evil of us. And uh, I was just sitting there thinking, wow, what are the odds of that? That's what I'm preaching about tonight. And we run into them, hadn't seen them in, I don't know, a year or two. And it just so happened to be this is the day that we did. And it's like, whew, always happens. He always confirms something. He always confirms the message. So I rest in the fact, and I'm thankful for the fact. And, you know, of course we, we should always pray for those who come against us. Anybody who would consider themselves enemies to us, we shouldn't have any enemies, but there will always be people who consider themselves enemies to us, and we should always pray for those folks. Because a lot of times, naysayers, they even think they're helping. They even think they're doing the right thing. Sometimes naysayers have a religious spirit about them and they think, man, I'm doing what God has called me to do. But unfortunately, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes people do have good advice and we should receive it, but other times people are just trying to bring you down. And a lot of times they don't want to see you succeed. A lot of times they have something against you to begin with. They want you to fail. Even if it's things of, for God. They don't want you to succeed, and that can be hurtful and discomforting at times. It can hurt your feelings, but thankfully, we have a God who is bigger than that. We have a God who can help us through even those situations. But people who accomplish big things in life must be willing to face naysayers who try to discourage them. 
When the Wright brothers tried to fly their first plane, people told them it would never work because humans can't fly. When Moses led the Israelites across the desert, the people complained, we're going to die. We want to go back to Egypt. Why did you bring us here? When John F. Kennedy said that the United States would send a man to the moon, many people said it can never be done. And if you ever set out to do something and a naysayer says you won't accomplish it, and you do fail at the thing you set out to do, it doesn't mean they were right. It just means you believe them. So don't quit. Keep pushing forward. There may be several failures before your success. It doesn't mean they were right the whole time. It just means don't give up. You know, sometimes we are going to fail, and that's a sad reality. And you may even have the right path. You may be on the right path and have the right purpose and plan, and you're doing everything you know to do, and you still fail. But guess what? If you are doing God's will, He will cause success to take place in whatever mission that He has given you. It just wasn't for that time. And timing is always in His hands. Sometimes we try to rush timing. Sometimes we try to rush, you know, God's plan. You know, you look throughout all the Bible, you see folks who hear God's plan and we're like, okay, let's do it this way. And God was saying, wait a second. <laughs> you know, you look at Abraham and he tried to rush God's timing. And unfortunately, he went around what God had said because he said, your wife is going to bear you a child. And he was thinking in his head, but she's 80 and that just doesn't work. And, and he tried to do it a different way because his wife suggested another option, go into my maidservant. So he did. And unfortunately, that wasn't what God had asked him to do. She did bear a child. His name was Ishmael. And he ended up fathering many children and became the first of the Muslim culture. And they had been at war with Israel ever since. And just like God said, Sarah would bear him a child. See, he tried to rush God's plan and mess things up. We have to wait, though. We, we might even go through some failures, but God's plan is always on time. Anybody thankful for that tonight? Thank you, Lord. All right, let's get into some scripture here. Proverbs 9, 7 through 8. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. See, sometimes we try to correct those scoffers, but they don't listen, do they? They just think they're right all the time, and you can't get through to them. But if you re rebuke a wise man, he will love you for it. Maybe not right away, because rebuke is never easy. But if you are wise, you will accept rebuke. Proverbs 13, verse 1. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So a scoffer is basically a naysayer, if y'all haven't caught on to that yet. There's always going to be scoffers everywhere you go and anytime you do anything. Uh, I know Vincent has taught little children how to play baseball, and I bet you you probably have come in contact with some parents who were remember, on the sidelines trying to tell you how to be a coach and coach this their kids. This is the first year out of at least 20 that I have not. Well, that's good. But you have experienced it. Thankfully, you didn't have to worry about it this year. I was involved in baseball, and I, as a kid, not a coach, and I saw it all the time. Parents mad about something. Always scoffing from the side. Oh, it can be very frustrating, especially when you're doing your best, and it's still getting scoffed at. And you're going to come across people who will not ever think your best is good enough. It don't matter how good you are doing. It don't matter how many people agree that you've done well. There's always going to be that one who says, 
you didn't do good. And it can hurt, especially if you're somebody who is putting everything they have into something. And you're putting everything you have into something you love and you care about, and there's still somebody says you didn't do good. It can hurt. But we have to trust in the fact that if we're serving God and we're doing our best, He will help us. And it doesn't matter about the scoffers. We have to get to the point to where we don't care what others say. We care more about what God says. All right. Proverbs 15, 12. A scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. So, obviously, he's not going to care about what somebody says. <coughs> Proverbs seventeen twenty one. He who begets a scoffer does so to his sorrow. So, if you have a child who's a scoffer, it's going to be to your own sorrow. And the father of a fool has no joy. Proverbs 21, 24. A proud and haughty man, or a scoffer, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. So a lot of times, being a scoffer, there's a lot of other things that are associated with it. Pride, haughtiness, all right, arrogance. You will see all of them combined. Proverbs 22, 10. Cast out the scoffer and contention or strife or fighting will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. So when no matter what you're doing, if there's a scoffer there, it's going to cause strife and contention and frustration and upsetness. And, and anytime you're ever around somebody that's that way, you just kind of, it just raises your blood pressure. It gets you frustrated. And it's hard to be around those folks that are that way all the time. Sometimes we all can get into a scoffing attitude. Oh, well, we got something wise to say, a wise crack. But if you are around anybody who is this way all the time, it can be so hard. Especially if you have to live with that individual. Proverbs 29, verse 8. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away from wrath. See, we got to remember, God is my avenger. So even though there's a scoffer around and they're trying to inflame us, enrage us, we must be wise and turn away from wrath. Don't lash out. That's what the flesh wants to do. And it's easy to do. Especially if you are in the right and they are in the wrong clearly. It's easy to lash out in our flesh and, and cause wrath. But we must turn away if we want to be wise. 2 Peter 3.3 Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. So, there's always been scoffers, but what I believe he's meaning here is there will be an increase in scoffers about everything. And if you've ever been on Facebook, you know that. <laughs> it feels like there's always some kind of drama. You know, there's always some kind of scoffer out there mad about something. And sometimes scoffers want to scoff at something because of the frustrations that they are dealing with. They want to lash out at others and talk bad about somebody else and all this because of the frustrations they have in their own life. And if we would realize that and think about that and even think that the devil may be using this person to get us, if we would stop and think and pray for that individual, like Jesus tells us to do. Pray for your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Help. Try to help in whatever way you can. Of course, they may not be willing to receive it and don't want care or want anything to do with you. But as much, as a, as much of it as depends on you, be in peace with all people. Try your best to make peace, even if it's fruitless. You must try your best. Whenever I was preparing this, uh, it automatically made me think about Job's friends. Job went through probably more than any of us will ever face in that short amount of time. And he had it bad. When you go through that book, you just feel so bad for Job. And, and then you also are having the back of your head thinking about God recommended him to the devil. Have you not considered my servant Job? He recommended him to get messed with and attacked. And you think, man, poor Job. 
But God did it for a reason, and we do see the conclusion of the matter. We see that God blessed him two times than what he even had with to begin with, and we see that now we have a book to reference when we go through our trials and tribulations. Nevertheless, God knows what he was doing, but I feel bad for him still. Nevertheless, he had his friends come, not to help him, but to accuse him, to say he had done something wrong. But we know from God's own mouth, have you not considered my servant Job? And he even calls him righteous. Job was a righteous man, and if God calls you out and says you're righteous, man, you better believe it. God says you're righteous, you must be a righteous man. He was recommended to the devil because God knew he was going to succeed. He had his doubts, he was frustrated at God, but he never cursed him. But the sad thing is, is you're going to have friends and family who come and scoff at what you've done too. Sometimes they're in the wrong, but sometimes they're in the right. But nevertheless, we're going to come in contact with family and friends who are supposed to be there for you, and they come against you. Because the devil knows what he's doing. And I'm going to read just a little short bit of just one of his friends that comes against him. Just a little bit of what he says. And I'm going to just highlight this portion. And kind of put yourself in Job's shoes. You know that you've been doing everything that you possibly can do that's right. And you have all this bad stuff suddenly thrust upon you. And in your lowest point, one of your friends who you've had you know, great memories with, somebody you've cherished throughout your life, comes against you in your lowest point. Not gives you a, a hug and says, I love you and I'm here for you, but comes against you and attacks you while you're already down, while you're already low. And I want you to try to put yourself in Job's shoes for a minute. But Eliphaz comes and thinks he knows it all, and he's telling him this. In verse 1, we're starting. Uh, actually, I mean, Job 4, 1 through 2, and then also uh, 7 through 21. So we'll start with verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? So he says, if I attempt to talk to you, you're going to get weary about it? You're going to get bothered already? But who can withhold himself from speaking? He's itching. He's chomping at the bit to tell him what all he's thinking. Man, I got you figured out, Job. I know exactly what you've been doing. And then in verse 7, we pick up. Remember now, Whoever perished being innocent. He's saying whoever has been punished by God for being innocent. Trying to say you've done something, Job. Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. He's saying you've been doing something wrong. You've been sinning. And you're reaping what you've sown. <laughs> and if you've if you know you've been doing everything you know to do right, which we all make mistakes, but if you can put yourself in Job's shoes for a second, you're thinking, what are you talking about? I just had my comp all my family wiped out, just me and my wife are left, all my workers, my whole livelihood has been destroyed, I got bulls all over my body, I'm hurting over here, and you saying I did something wrong to deserve this? Wouldn't you be getting frustrated by now? <laughs> I know I would. I would be pretty bothered at my friend. By the blast of God they perish. And by breath of His anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion. The voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey, but the cubs of the lioness are scattered. He's trying to talk about, you know, using different uh, metaphors here. And then he says something very kind of scary. He says, Now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. In disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me and trembled which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair on my body stood up. 
It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts no trust in his servants, if he cha charges his angels with error, how much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth. They are broken in pieces from morning till evening. They perish forever with no one regarding does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. Now I want to clarify something with you for a second. God gave the devil permission to use any method he wanted to to attack Job. Except he can't kill him. Any method. So we already know that God considers Job righteous, right? Have you not considered my servant Job? And we see that the devil uses his friends to come attack him. So, who was it that came to talk to him? Who was it that came to talk to Job's friend to try to use this conversation to attack Job? Who do you think it was? Was it God himself? No. It was the devil or a demon sent to his friend to try to get his friend to parrot this phrase back to him. The devil is very active in this world. His demons are as well. A lot of times we dismiss it. We think the person that we're talking to or communicating with is just another person, just flesh and blood. But the Bible tells us that we don't deal with flesh and blood. We deal with those principalities in the high places. And they use us to get with and attack one another in various ways. There's another place where Peter rebuked Jesus. Don't go to the cross. Don't go. And Jesus didn't rebuke Peter. He rebuked Satan behind Peter because he knew who it was trying to get him not to go to the cross. And that's exactly what still happens today and what was taking place with our brother Job. His friend received this vision, not from an angel, not from God, but from the devil. And sometimes the devil will come and give us thoughts in the same way. It might happen in a dream, might happen in a vision, might happen just by you sitting there and you hearing something and you, you latch hold of that thought and use it against somebody else. We never know when we're being puppeted. But we need to always check ourselves. Make sure what we're saying, does it line up with the Word of God? Am I speaking in love? Am I speaking with the Spirit? And then we must check what somebody else says to us in the same way. But unfortunately, Job's friend was not speaking from the Lord. He was speaking from Satan and being attacked in that way. Now, if y'all want to go read in your own personal studies more of those uh, conversations that took place. He had it a lot. He had three friends come against him. And by the end of it, he had his fill of it. I'm going to tell you. I would have too. Here's another scenario. David's brother, King David, but at the time he was just a shepherd. David's brother uh, came against him about coming down to try to kill Goliath. So we have David's brother who's in the army and too scared to go face Goliath. He's too scared because Goliath was a giant, okay? His sword was probably taller than some of us in this room. Just a sword alone. And he had a spear, and he had a shield, and he had full armor. Can you imagine somebody standing up, you know, to those beams right there and just lumbering? You know, we the, probably the biggest person we could think of, somebody in the NBA or NFL or something like that. But this guy was even bigger stronger, battle-hardened, calling them down. Come on, who's going to face me? And all the guys in the Israel army are like, hey, man, we don't want to fight this guy because he's, he's too big. Because they were average people, you know, just regular dudes, you know. And then here you go, you got your little young brother coming down saying, hey, I'm about to take this guy down. And you're like, you're kind of getting embarrassed a little bit, kind of feeling a little shameful. And you scoff out at him. And this is what he says. 
1 Samuel 17, 28 and 29. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, when David was speaking to him. He gave him a big, long speech. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Oh, those poor sheep. He was really worried about them, wasn't he? I know your pride. See, look, Eliab was trying to say David had pride when it was really Eliab who had the pride. Sometimes you're going to come across scoffers who will use a reverse psychology on you and try to say you're the one with pride when they're really the ones with the pride. That's what he was doing here with poor old David. And the insolence of your heart, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. That's all you want to do. You're not really going to go out there and fight this guy. And David said, what have I done now? Sometimes we're going to feel that way too when somebody comes and says, what have I done? Why are you coming against me? And he says, is there not a cause? We got this guy down here insulting us, insulting our God. Is not anybody going to come out there and face him? If nobody else will, here I am, here I am send me. I will go. And sometimes we got to have that mentality. You see a cause and nobody's standing up for it, you got to be the one. Somebody's got to be the one. He went out there and we know from reading the Bible he did conquer Goliath. He was already battle-hardened himself. He was already practiced with protecting those sheep. He was killing bears and lions and all kinds of stuff with a slingshot. Now that's pretty, pretty awesome. He didn't need a sword. He was already battle-hardened. He, he was not scared. And a lot of what we must face in this world has to do with fear. And we have to be to the point to where we're not scared of anything. We're not fearful of any situation. We're not worried about it because my God is bigger than this circumstance. Yeah. My God is bigger than the lions, the bears, the tigers, and oh my eyes. He's bigger than the giants, those Goliaths that are out there. He's bigger than the mountains that come in, in the problems, the trials, the tribulations, the storms. He's bigger than all of it. And it's not anything in us, it's not our strength that overcomes it, but it's His strength in us and for any circumstance. Amen. And we got to believe that. So are we scared about anything that comes our way? We shouldn't be. But sometimes those scoffers, it can be just enough to get you to back off. I'm so glad that David didn't get bothered by his brother scoffing at him. Friends and family... I'm so glad that he went through with it because now we have a David versus Goliath story for ourselves. Sometimes there are situations that are so big beyond us that we feel like we can't ever overcome. But it's because of that story that gives us hope. It's because of stories like Job overcoming his circumstance that gives us hope for our circumstances. That we too can conquer and overcome and be victorious and win and be in success in our situations, but only through Him. But unfortunately, they're going to come, the scoffers. Here's another one, another situation. Everybody doing okay? There's another situation. Nehemiah, does anybody remember reading about Nehemiah? Going to build the walls back up in Jerusalem. Well, there was a couple guys named Sanballat and Tobias. There will always be some Sanballats and Tobiases in our life. But it, we're going gonna, gonna to read Nehemiah 4, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to read some other ones here in a second. But I'll read those often when it's time. But Nehemiah 4, verses 1 and 2. But it so happened... When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. See, scoffers love to mock. They love to make fun. Little quips. They like to quip you to death. They like to be mean, but like snarky. You ever have to deal with somebody like that? It's so frustrating. They mock you, make fun of you. Yeah. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? 
try to make fun of them. I'm trying to, people are going to make fun of you too. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? He's trying to make fun of them, trying to discourage them. You really think you're going to be able to do this? And there wasn't that many of them either. There wasn't like thousands of people. They didn't have cranes back in the day. And they, they had to do all this by hand. And they had to do it, I'm sure, in the heat of the day. In the hot sun, everybody's having to work. Oh, let's build this wall. And you got people in the background. What are you going to do? That makes it so much harder. When you're trying to work and, you know, do something. It, it's bad enough seeing the standards and leaners. Y'all have all seen those. In any job, there's always a stander and a leaner. Somebody who's watching what you're doing and they ain't doing nothing themselves. They're good at standing and leaning, though. And sometimes they're like, you could do it this way or you could do it that way. They're good. They got all the advice in the world, but they're not good about helping. And sometimes it's even worse when you got a stander and a leaner and you got somebody in the background scoffing at what you are already doing. Instead of telling me how to do it better, won't you come show me and do it, right? Put your hands on it. Yeah, put your hands on it. Let's see you do some work, all right? Nevertheless, these guys weren't working, and they were all, the only objective they had was to get them to quit. You're going to have folks in your life that you come across who will do the same thing. They don't want you to succeed for whatever reason it may be. They have ulterior motives. They may even come as wolves in sheep's clothing. They may even come pretending to be your friend. Oh, what, what are you trying that for? That's too hard for you to do. Don't worry about that. Just come hang out with me. Doing nothing. But if God has called you to it, you must go through it. Amen? You must see it to completion. Don't worry about the details because God is in the details. There's another phrasing, the devil's in the details. Well, I like to say God is in the details. Amen. He will get you through it. <clears throat> and when Nehemiah began to rebuild the broken down walls around Jer Jerusalem, a few naysayers began to say nay. They yelled nay to Nehemiah's vision of restoring Jerusalem to its former glory. Nay, to bring the scattered Jews back to Jerusalem. And they, to helping the city on a hill, shine the glory of God to all the nations like it once did. There's going to be naysayers and they're going to come and be saying all kinds of negatives in your life as well. But one thing that we can do is pray them quiet. Pray them quiet. Like I said, there ain't nobody who can avenge like our God. Listen to what Nehemiah says in verses and in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, listen to what he says. Was he getting discouraged? Was he getting discouraged at Sanballat's message? Was he worried about his naysaying? Listen to what he says. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Whatever they're speaking against me, put it back on them. And give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you. For they have provoked you to anger before the builders. See, it wasn't Nehemiah just saying, hey, I just feel like building the wall. God had got him to do it. He knew that he was on a mission. He was sent by God and you will have a mission of your own. If you're not on it right now, you will be. God has us all doing something. He has us all working for Him. And God may specifically tell you to do something for Him, and then the devil comes trying to get you to quit, trying to get you to stop. You must be at a place to where you know your enemy. It's not flesh and blood you're dealing with. You're dealing with Satan and his, his minions, the devil, the demons. Pray against that. Pray them quiet. Shut the mouths of lions. Shut the mouths of the scoffers that are coming against your work, God. He likes us to remind him. He already knows. He won't ever forget. God, this is your work. You have got me to do it. Shut those mouths. 
pray them quiet. But every time Nehemiah's naysayers attacked him with words, Nehemiah took it to the throne room of God in prayer. He asked God to shut them up, shut their efforts down. Was he trying to shut them up? No, because as we saw back in Proverbs, you try to rebuke a scoffer, he's coming against you, right? He's going to shut you down. God is our avenger. Don't worry about them. You go to God. He'll take care of it. He asked God to intervene on his behalf, and that's where we need to be as well. He took their threat seriously enough to ask God to take swift and decisive action, turn it around on them. And many times throughout the Bible, you will see armies coming against Israel, and God causes confusion in that army, and they'll end up attacking themselves. God can cause people who are coming against you to end up fighting amongst themselves and leave you alone. Oh, Lord, help us. Here's another one. Number two, don't waste too much time responding to the naysayers. All right? Yes, there's a time and place to respond. Yes, sometimes they need to be corrected. Nevertheless, don't spend too much time because it's going to take you away from your work. We're going to go to Nehemiah 2, 19 through 20. 19 in verse 20. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem and the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, and you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Sometimes we need to answer those scoffers, but we answer them with, God is on my side. And sometimes that's going to be the encouragement that helps you, remembering that fact. God's on my side. I'm on his team, and I'm doing what he's called me to do. And you're going to have the frustrations. You're going to have the naysayers. You're going to have the attacks. You're going to have the calamities even come, like Job. But don't get discouraged. Keep pushing forward. Amen? Nehemiah tried to quickly shut them down and their false accusations of his efforts. He made it clear that he and the Jews had a historic right in the city. They were there, and that's what God had called them to. All right. Number three, final one, we're getting close to the end. Put the focus on celebrating God, not gloating over the naysayers as your ministry or vision gets accomplished. Sometimes when we succeed, we want to say, boom, see, I told you. We want to throw it back in somebody's face, but don't worry about that. Nehemiah 6, verse 16. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, the completion of the wall, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Man, God will go before you and He will help what you have accomplished be recognized by even your enemies and some of them will be ashamed that they scoffed against you in the first place. They thought even maybe they were working for God and coming against this thing for God, but in the end they will see that they were fighting against God in the first place. There will be people that way. As we see throughout the Bible, there's places where it talks about that, but Paul is one of the best examples. He at first was a Pharisee and came against the church and was used to help find the Christians and get them killed and thrown in jail. He was coming against God's work and then Jesus had to appear to him on the road of Damascus and say, what are you doing? And Paul said, oh my Lord. He realized his mistake and got on the bandwagon. He realized his mistake and became one of the greatest authors in the Bible itself and wrote most of the New Testament, was one of the greatest apostles of Jesus and fought for his cause and died for his cause. And we have to be the same way. And those people who were coming against you might do the same. They might see the completion of your work, your mission that God has set before you, and say, man, I was wrong. 
I should have never come against them in the first place, but I should have been helping them. I should have helped that plan to succeed. I should have been right along with them instead of coming against them the whole time. And maybe God will bring reconciliation to you and them. And it can be so. Never think anything is too far out. God can do anything. God can bring anybody back into the fold. Oh, thank you, Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those to whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. No matter what happens to you, His joy is your strength. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how many scoffers come your way, His joy is your strength. Joy is is a constant because of the Holy Spirit who produces it inside of you. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If you don't have that memorized, that's one of the best ones to do so. Go look it up. And joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And it produces inside of you whether you want it or not. What Despite your circumstances. But you have to lay hold of it. You have to take hold of it and remember that. Because the devil will try to steal your joy, but the only way he can steal it is if you give it to him. Don't give it to him. Despite your circumstances, praise God. Praise him in the storm. Just like Paul and Silas did when they were thrown in prison. They just got through getting beat. They didn't go in there woe and as me. They didn't go in there crying. They came out praising. We got to do the same thing. Even if you're fresh with blood on your back. God, I love you so good. Praise Him in your storm. It's there for a reason. It's for our remembrance and encouragement. You have got to remember praise is a weapon to you. Fight against the devil with praise in your circumstances. Because the storm's coming. If it ain't here, it's on the way. But while it's happening, praise until it's over. And then praise once it's over. Because He deserves it, doesn't He? But God used Nehemiah to accomplish a very specific mission. Building a wall around the city of Jerusalem. God wants to use you to accomplish a very specific mission as well. Multiplying disciples in and around your city. Nehemiah didn't allow the naysayers to stop him. Neither should you. But when God comes through, don't gloat over them. Instead, celebrate all that God has done and put the focus on Him. Not yourself, not on them, not the problem, but on the problem solver. Always keep your focus on Him. He will help you in the mission. He will help you when you're getting bombarded. He will help you when you're feeling at your lowest. He is there for you. And finally, our last thing for us to remember is people even scoffed and accused and tested Jesus. And we know for a fact that He was perfect, don't we? We know for a fact that He could do no wrong. But even they who were supposed religious leaders of His day came against Him. And there's a religious spirit still out and about trying to get people to think they're doing right, trying to think that they are doing God's will just like Paul. But they're not. They're doing what the devil wants them to do. And this instance here we're going to read about in Matthew 22, 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, uh-oh, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him on purpose, trying to get him to mess up. And saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We have a Pharisee who is also a lawyer. And I don't know about you, but I like watching court shows. For some reason, I like seeing 
them, you know, the good guys win, obviously. I want to see that lawyer argue his case. And the judge is like, you know, boom. And it's in his favor. I like seeing stuff like that for some reason. I don't know why. I've always been that way. But we have a lawyer here. And he's a Pharisee. And he's coming against Jesus. And he's trying to stump him. He's trying to test him. What's the great law? And what's the greatest commandment in the law? Because he, you know, I'm sure he had an answer in his own mind. And Jesus gives him the best example. He gives him the best thing you could ever say. I'm glad for the scoffer here. I'm glad for this lawyer who thinks he was so smart that he's going to stump Jesus. I'm glad because now I got clarification from Jesus. What's the greatest commandment? Boom, here you go. It's to love. Now I have this written down for all eternity and I can reference it. What is the greatest commandment? It's to love. Love God with everything in you and then love your neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Somebody else asked that later on. It's everybody. Everybody. That makes it easy. Just love everybody to the best of your ability, even the naysayers, even your enemies, even the unlovables. Love everybody makes it so simple. I'm thankful for that naysayer in that situation at least. That even in the naysayers, they don't know what they're doing. They're coming against them. Maybe it's Satan behind them pulling strings. Hey, let's let's test that Christian over there. But guess who's behind you? God. You ain't doing it by yourself. Anybody thankful for that? You ain't on a team of one. It ain't me, myself, and I. Okay, you're on the team, Jesus, and He's got your back through whatever you got to go through. Even the scoffers. And they're going to come trying to test you too. They're going to test your patience. They're going to test your will. They're going to test your knowledge. They're going to test your pa- They're going to test everything. But you have to rest on Him. And He will back you up. If you're serving Him and you're on a mission for Him, God will go before you as a banner. And He will be the one who declares what you're doing is right. He will cause what you have done to succeed. It may take a while. It's always in His timing. But He will be the one. And you can be rest in that fact. Oh God, thank you for being my avenger. He will take care of you. But you got to remember those things. Pray for your enemies. Pray for the help in the situations. Pray for the patience if you need it. Pray for everything and never stop. 